Well, I have to say, standing here on this rather intimidating red TEDx mat in one of uh, Britain's finest universities in front of an audience who are intelligent, questioning, and perhaps a little skeptical, it slightly reminds me of being on the back ramp of an aircraft many thousands of feet up in a parachute rig with a kit bag the size of a fridge strapped to the front looking out into a, a night sky with the cold air circulating, waiting for that light on the door frame, the red light to come on, and then the green light, which tells me it's time to go. So I'm going to talk to you about strategy, because you are the leaders of tomorrow. The title of this thing is Make Your Mark. If you're going to make your mark by achieving big things, then you'll need strategy. And I'm just going to tell you three things about strategy in the 15 short minutes that I've got, and then one point about leadership. And I'm going to illustrate my points from experiences that I've had over nearly 40 years of command of troops, amazing people, uh, in their tens at the tactical level as a junior officer, in their thousands at the operational level, at the campaign level, and in their tens of thousands at the strategic level. And I've had the opportunity to operate in the context of a number of campaigns with a number of strategies, some of which I've had influence on, some of which I haven't. Some of which have been good, others not so good. And the trick is to learn from your experiences, and I hope to impart some of my experiences to you for the challenges that you face in the future whether that's building a business, uh, starting a new charity, going for gold in the Olympics, leading a sporting team to success, uh, whether it's dealing with the challenge of the COVID-19 virus or converting a part of the economy to green energy. Whatever it is, whatever the big project is that you want to lead, you will need strategy. So what is strategy? I mean, put in its very simplest terms, strategy is the roadmap of steps, of objectives along the route to that big thing that you want to achieve. And to have a strategy, you've got to decide what that big thing is going to, going to be. You've got to identify your strategic objective. And you've got to focus on that throughout the process of getting there, because it's very easy to be distracted. What you need to do, as well as mapping out that path, and it's not just necessarily a linear path, it may have many branches along the route, and it'll bring together many lines of operation to get to the intermediate objectives and then to that strategic objective. What you need to do is to integrate effects. I'll explain, and I'll give you an example at the national and coalition level. In 2003, I had the honor of commanding the 7th Armored Brigade, the Desert Rats, in Iraq. Now, the invasion of Iraq has been much criticized, and I'm not going to re-enter that argument. But the fact is that if, as a nation, as a coalition, you are undertaking something of that scale, and sometimes it is necessary to use force to uh, address a problem at that scale, and I think of the challenge facing um, our predecessors at the end of the Second World War dealing with the challenge of Nazism. It had to be confronted. And in those days, all the levers of national power were applied to the task in hand. That wasn't the case in Iraq. Uh, the affair was largely subcontracted out to the military. And in the UK, the sort of departments who should have had the resources and the opportunity to be a part of that national effort at a ver very early stage just simply weren't involved to the extent that they needed to be. The Department for International Development, all the other departments who could have uh, contributed in their, in their parts. So the result was that after the combat phase, when we faced the task of stabilization, our brigade 
uh, which was faced with very considerable military and security tasks to secure the province to look after the infrastructure which was being raided and plundered by a population who were venting their anger against the previous regime. We found ourselves also doing a number of things which really should have been uh, led, if not done, by others. Restarting hospitals, getting the water supply back and up and running, sorting out waste clearance in the streets, reopening the schools, paying 180,000 civilian workers their salaries to get the economy started. Huge tasks. And as a result of not being able to do these things as efficiently as we should have been able to at the national level with the help that we required, uh, we helped create the conditions which eventually allowed the emergence of a very dangerous insurgency and created great un instability. And the lesson for us at the national and coalition level is right at the beginning of the process, when you're starting the, the strategic planning, get all the levers of national and collective power harmonized in synchronization to do the job in hand. And the lesson for you when you're achieving great things in the future is use all the powers at your disposal. Use all the departments within the organizations you run. Remember the small contributions of those small departments on one side. Involve the people. Everybody has to be integrated into one process which brings everybody together to achieve your objective. Very important. The next thing that I will refer to is the requirement to be ready to deal with setbacks. When you're running a strategy, you need measures of success, whether you run a daily meeting to assess how you're doing or weekly, however it is, periodically you need to look at how you're doing on the various lines of operation, how you're doing in achieving those intermediate targets en route to that big target out there in front of you. Your measures of success need to be carefully put together and you need to be able to judge when a course of action is succeeding or whether it's failing and you need to move to another course of action. If you face setbacks along the route, which you always will because no plan survives contact with reality, then you need to keep a cool head, think laterally, think of your options, make a bold correction and move forward. I'll give you another example and it stems from that same time in 2003. I told you that we had a pressing task of getting the services of a war-battered province up and running. So we got together the Iraqi experts who had been running these things beforehand, who were the experts in their own country, and our aim was to help them sort out the services and the infrastructure. So we set up a technical group to get the services back up and running in the province, a province the size of Northern Ireland with a city of half a million people. In slower time, we were going to form a political committee to bring together the religious groups, the interest groups, the tribes, uh, into a political grouping to elect a governor to be the political leader of the province. But that was in slower time. So we set up the technical group, they started work, it was advertised, things started to move, and almost immediately we were faced with huge demonstrations on the streets. Rather counterintuitive, you would think. But the sadrists, who were the more robust of the sheer religious groups in the city, were determined that the politics was going to be sorted out first. And I should have remembered that in that culture, he who delivers the goods gets the waster gets the credit. And they were very keen that they were going to be in charge politically, but in any case, that was to be resolved before anybody was seen to be running the province and getting the credit for it. So we started negotiations with them. We immediately put the workings of the technical group on hold, although the development progress continued, and we started intensive 
political talks to form a political committee to elect a new governor, a new Iraqi governor for the province. That happened, and they elected a moderate, uh, well-respected former lawyer without a strong religious or political affiliation who was acceptable to everybody in the province to be the first post-war uh, governor. The demonstrations immediately stopped and the whole thing calmed down. And the lesson for us was we had gone forward on the wrong path first, we'd got our sequencing wrong, we had to recognize that, keep cool, make a bold correction, make the change and get on with it. And progress started to be made. And the lesson for you is obvious. Don't be put off by setbacks. Be ready to change course, but keep focused on the strategic objective. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to talk about very briefly is culture. If you're trying to do big things with a big complex organization and you're trying to change its course radically, you may, not always, but you may have to address the need for a culture change. And I think of my time as the commander of the UK Land Forces when a new plan came out to save manpower by relying much more on the reserve forces as part of our military response to any particular problem. They were going to be integrated into the force in a much more mainstream way than they had before. This was going to require quite a considerable culture change from the regular full-time army who were going to have to trust part-timers to be alongside them delivering very complex, uh, difficult capabilities on the basis of much less training. So what we directed was that the regular units and the reserve units were going to pair together in pairs, and then we directed that in any substantive activity of the one, whether it were an exercise, an operation, or whatever it was, there would be an exchange of manpower between the two in order that the two halves got to know each other, integrate, and to trust each other. I also directed that the annual appraisal of the commanding officers of those units would also reflect, in part, how well they had done, how determinedly they had addressed this requirement. And the lesson for you is that if you're trying to impart culture change on an organization, you have to get the various parts to integrate together and buy into the concept. And you do have to get the leaders at every level to work hard to make that happen, even if initially it's rather against their instincts to do so. There may be a bit of a forcing function. Of course, eventually, you have to recognize if it's not a good idea, it's the wrong thing to do. But very often a forcing function is necessary at the start of the process. So some things about strategy which is important to remember. Integrate effects. Don't be put off by setbacks. Be ready to make bold corrections and be ready to address the need for culture change. One small point on leadership, which I learned at a very early stage. If you're going to lead big things in life, you've got to have determination, you've got to have guts, and you've got to have confidence. You've got to have one more thing, which is most important. You've got to have humility. And I'll illustrate this with a lesson that I learned as a very junior officer. Actually, one learns it the whole time in life. And if you don't learn it, it comes to bite you. I'll go back to where I started with parachuting. And I was parachuting on one occasion in a jungle region, in primary jungle. We had a drop zone on the side of a big, wide, brown, muddy river. And myself and the last two people in the stick had jumped out of the aircraft. We were under the canopy. And it was pretty obvious that the wind had changed and we were not going to get back over the river to our drop zone. We had one option, which was to head to the 120 feet high canopy trees of the primary jungle on the other side of the river. Well, fortunately, there were a few little squares of indigenous cultivation of cassava patches. And I chose one of these, steered in towards it, realized 
when I got the ground rush at the end that it was much smaller than I thought and it was on a, on a steep ridge like that. I missed the ridge, I stalled the parachute and I grabbed onto the trunk of a smooth tree quite a long way up and hotched my backside onto a branch and thought, what am I going to do about this? So I unclipped the parachute and fortunately it was one of those white, smooth trunked trees and I could put my arms and legs around it and slide about 40 or 50 feet down to the jungle floor, get out my compass and head for the river. And after about 15 minutes, I arrived at the river bank and as I parted the thick vegetation on the side of the river, a dugout canoe pulled in like a taxi arriving at a cab rank with two indigenous tribesmen in it who beckoned for me to get in. It was pretty obvious they had seen my descent, they'd seen where I'd landed, they knew exactly when and where I was going to emerge. So I stepped into the canoe and I beckoned with sign language that my parachute was still up the tree. One of the indigenous guys jumped out, tabbed off into the jungle. He arrived back in, I seem to remember, a little shorter time that it, than it had taken me to walk one way with my parachute. He had found his way back through thick jungle vegetation to precisely the tree. He'd shimmied up the tree, goodness knows how. He'd got the parachute and he'd arrived back at the canoe. That was a lesson in humility. What that reminded me, and I've been reminded time and time again, is that the guys who live there, those who might appear rather unsophisticated in their own environment, know that environment so much better than we ever will. And the lesson for you all is that when you're operating in an unfamiliar environment, in an unfamiliar bit of geography, in a part of business or life or enterprise that you're not fully familiar with, ask the people who know. Because they probably know and understand so much more than even they know. Okay, so that's the last lesson. You've had a bit about strategy. All I want to do now is wish you the very best of good fortune in making your mark. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.